Good evening. I am Tanya Zanish Belcher, and I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Women's Leadership Consortium with support from the Office of the Provost and the Committee on Lectures. We would also like to encourage you to stay for the reception following. And now I would like to tell you a little bit about our speaker tonight, and there is a great deal to share. Gretchen M. Bataille is the Senior Vice President for Leadership and Lifelong Learning for the American Council on Education. The leadership programs she oversees include the Institute for New Presidents, the ACE Fellows Program, Advancing to the Presidency, Presidential Roundtables, and multiple national and regional programs to expand the diversity of higher education leadership. Gretchen has an impressive list of leadership credentials herself. She served for four years as president of the University of North Texas, a research university with over 36,000 students. She was senior vice president of the University of North Carolina system for six years, and during that time served for a year as interim chancellor at North Carolina School of the Arts. After nearly 20 years as a faculty member here at Iowa State, she served as the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Associate Dean for Academic Personnel at Arizona State University, Provost of the College of Letters and Science at UC Santa Barbara, and Provost at Washington State University. At each university, she was appointed as a tenured member of the faculty, teaching in the departments of English, American Studies, or Women's Studies. Before joining the American Council on Education, she served the Fashion Institute Institute of Technology in New York City as Interim Vice President for Academic Affairs. Dr. Bataille, whose scholarly specialization is American Indian Literature, received her bachelor's and master's degrees at California Polytechnic State University and her doctorate in English at Drake University. And I also want to add that Dr. Bataille's book is for sale by the University Bookstore. Oh, it's not your book. Women at the Top is for sale uh, at, by the University Bookstore. At least it's about women in leadership. But anyway, I'd like to invite Dr. Bataille to come right now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tanya. It sounds as if I can't keep a job with all the places I've been. Actually, my son accused me of moving only to party schools, if you listen to the schools I've been to. This is indeed quite a homecoming for me. Uh, as you heard, I spent 20 years, nearly 20 years, in Ames, Iowa, and teaching at Iowa State. So the Memorial Union and this campus uh, bring back a lot of memories. Many of you in the audience, and I'm pleased to see there are students here, weren't born yet when I and some of my old, and I mean that only lovingly, old friends were on this campus working long hours to support students and to make a difference. But it really wasn't until I sort of walked on the campus that I started thinking about all these memories. I remember being in the Union right out there one late afternoon when I was confronted by members of the American Indian Movement who threatened to burn this building down if we didn't add them to the American Indian Symposium Program. Well, today, and after having been a president, I realized I really should have reported that incident uh, to security, to risk management, certainly someone above me. I mean, I was just a faculty member. Instead, I suggested that they join us for dinner at the Gradwall's house so we could talk about their concerns. Well, I know my friend Hannah was surprised uh, to have these additional dinner guests who arrived at her home. Her great cooking and her son Stephen's invitation to them to take off all their regalia and play basketball convinced them that we came in peace. We did add them to the program, and we were indeed enriched by their perspective. Is that better? Okay, sorry. All right, so I was here, as I said, long before many of you were born, during the late 60s, the 70s, and into the 80s. These were times of churn and unrest on many campuses, and Iowa State was no exception. As I think back on those pre-Twitter and, yes, pre-email days, some of you probably can't imagine how we managed to accomplish anything without social media. 
Iowa, though, was not the backwater that it was probably imagined to be by our colleagues on both coasts. Iowa State was one of the first places to have an American Indian Studies program and a Women's Studies program. I showed the documentary, The Wrath of Grapes, about migrant farm workers in my propaganda analysis course. And many years later, my daughter, who was born in Ames, married the brother of Lori Parley, who produced that film. I'm always amazed at how things do indeed come full circle in ways we would never have imagined. We hired Jane Smiley to teach in the creative writing program before she memorialized Iowa State in her book, Moo. There were courses in black studies, and the vibrant lecture program that exists today was run by our dear friend, Jim Lowry. And we thank Pat for continuing that tradition. If Twitter had existed, it certainly would have been humming with the news of one of my English department colleagues burning his draft card or the pro Vietnam protests that were on campus. And in the state of Iowa, with a moderate Republican governor, who probably in today's standards would be a Democrat, um, Bob Ray, we were also making statements. I served on the Iowa Civil Rights Commission along with my dear friend, Evelyn Belines. And we adjudicated cases that resulted in car dealers being told that they could not exclude women from selling cars. The Meskwaki people in Tama and Toledo could no longer be denied entrance into public restaurants and bars. And redlining could no longer be used to exclude African Americans from buying homes in white neighborhoods. Perhaps most significantly for women, the commission declared that six girl basketball violated Title IX because Iowa high school girls weren't getting scholarships to college because of the limitations of their high school sport. This year marks the 40th anniversary of Title IX. It's hard to believe. For those of you too young to know the rules, girls basketball in those days had six girls to a team three forwards and three guards, and they each played half a court. It was assumed it was too strenuous for girls to run down that entire court. They could only dribble twice and then had to shoot. Uh, and a friend who played basketball in those days said that she was always teased by her sons when she had sons and they were growing up, that the only thing she knew about basketball was a dribble, dribble, shoot. Well, neither Evelyn nor I were reappointed to the commission, having violated a sacred tradition in Iowa, but it was the right decision. This came home to me many, many years later when a young assistant basketball coach came up to me in tears and thanked me because soon after Iowa ended sixth girl basketball, she played basketball in Iowa and got a scholarship that made college possible for her cash-strapped family. It was, in the end, all worth it. Well, there was more going on as well. I invited members of the Des Moines Black Panthers to visit my freshman English class to talk about the breakfast program in poor neighborhoods in Des Moines. I also had an uninvited member of the American Indian Movement monitor my classes because the movement was suspicious that a white woman was teaching American Indian literature. For me, what characterized that period in my career and life was that we were all so passionate about what we believed in and our actions followed those passions, sometimes probably not necessarily in the right ways, but perhaps what is missing today in the instant communication is that we are bombarded by so much information and so many sound bites that sometimes we forget to remember what we really believe. But that is actually the topic of a different lecture. I was asked to talk about women and leadership. Each of us approaches a topic from the place where we stand. And right now, I stand in the role of the senior vice president for a major higher education association, one that has grown from its beginnings in 1919 as the Emergency Council on Education to become the American Council on Education with over 1,800 institutional members. Given what's going on in education today, many of us think we should return to that old title, the Emergency <laughs> Council on Education. 
Well, I can't help but return for a moment to another memory as I recount how I got to where I am today. One very cold December holiday break, although I think every holiday break in December in Ames is cold, uh, a group of women were complaining about the fact that we had to walk back and forth across campus from our offices to our classes and we had to wear skirts. And in those days, we were wearing mini skirts. A group of women in the Department of English decided we would come back in January and we would wear pants to class. Sounds really revolutionary, doesn't it? We thought it was. We really thought we were right at the forefront of revolution. We were dismayed, though, because no one noticed. And I suspect that many of the men in the department wondered why it had taken us so long to figure it out. Those early days in my career did prepare me well for the future. I had wonderful academic colleagues here, terrific mentors and friends. After nearly 20 years here, though, I moved on. But I am still rooted in Iowa and in my experiences here. I was asked to talk about women in leadership, and I need to talk about leadership, but I also need to talk about values and ethics, because I think those two things are inextricably linked. While women make up half the workforce, less than 8% hold positions in senior management. I'm talking now about the corporate world. And only 1% of the top corporate jobs are held by women. The academy isn't much different. Today, 57% of all undergraduate students are women. And you may not know this, but in Iowa, it's 61%. 57% of all graduate students are women, and 61% of graduate students in Iowa are women. Forty percent of law students are women. But these percentages are not reflected among faculty ranks in higher education. In fact, in public research universities, 61 percent of the full-time faculty are men. ACE just completed its 2012 study of the American College President. The results tell us that the average college president is male, white, and 61 years old. 58% of sitting presidents are over the age of 61. And that's up from 49% back in 2006. <clears throat> Between 1986 and 2011, the majority of presidents have, presidents have shifted from 50 or younger to 61 or older. There is some good news about women in presidencies. The share of women presidents has increased from 23% to 26% since 2006. It was 13% in 1986. Most of that growth has been among white women. Women presidents, though, are more likely to head community colleges than they are likely to head research universities. However, the largest increase in women heading universities occurred over the past five years in doctoral granting institutions where women pre represented 14 percent of presidents in 2006 and they represent 22 percent in 2011. So this is both gratifying and somewhat surprising, although clearly the numbers are still low. ACE does not only look at women in leadership positions, but we also compile the statistics of racial and ethnic minority groups in leadership positions. Members of racial and ethnic minority groups represented a smaller share of presidencies in 2011 than they did in 2006. In 2006, 14% of presidents belonged to identified with racial or ethnic groups. That dropped to 13% in 2011. Hispanics account for the decline in minority presidents as their percentage has dropped from 5% to 4% at a time when this is the largest and fastest growing demographic group in the US. The percentage of African American presidents remains virtually unchanged, and so that is also, and that is also true for American Indian presidents, mostly because it is African American presidents who generally head HBCUs and American Indian presidents who head tribal colleges. 
The number of Asian American uh, presidents has remained very low. Uh, it's about 2%. And what's really interesting is that the, per the percent of Asian American faculty on those campuses is quite high, but they don't get into leadership positions. What's interesting is if they do, such as Dartmouth's president, Jim Young Kim, um, they rapidly get picked off somewhere else, so now he's leading the World Bank. <clears throat> well, so while there are 24% of faculty and senior staff who are minorities in higher education, those numbers are not at all represented at the presidential level. When you exclude the minority presidents of HBCUs and tribal colleges, the percentage of minority presidents goes down from 14 to 9%. And that statistic of 9% remains unchanged from since 2007. So what's going on? Clearly, there is work to be done on the pipeline. There is a decline in the percent of racial and ethnic minority presidents. Women in presidencies, while increasing, are nowhere near where we might like to see them. The high number of projected retirements of presidents, if you just look at the ages and the aging presidency, uh, means that there may be a temporary shortage of leadership or a great opportunity. And it's really up to us on campuses and in leadership positions to figure out whether this is going to be a shortage or an opportunity. It will not happen unless institutions focus very intentionally on succession planning with presidents and other leaders identifying, developing, and supporting leadership talent. Well, some of you may wonder, what does all this have to do with your own experiences? Because I was asked to talk about my own experiences. So I'm going to talk about my journey through higher education, a journey that, in fact, has led me to a wonderful place where now I have an opportunity to meet men and women in higher education from throughout the country. And I can experience a variety of issues that are making the lives of people who have jobs in higher education more and more difficult. Well, the studies show that women who do succeed have learned the corporate game. They have taken control of their careers. They have confidence in knowing their strengths. They know when to rely on others. They understand the bottom line, and they go for it. They integrate their professional and personal lives. I get accused of not integrating my personal life into my professional life very well, but we try. The image, though, that's often familiar to women is a picture of a baseball diamond. And there are men at all the bases. And there's a man there at the pitcher's mound. And there's a woman standing at home plate, bouncing a basketball. And she's saying, now, what is this game? And I think that is often how women feel. What is the game? What are the rules? And do men and women play by the same rules? Well, my academic area, as you know, is literature. So I like to tell stories. When my son was in elementary school, and you know how teachers are always saying, what does your mommy do, what does your daddy do? My son announced that I teach stories to big kids, which is, I guess, what I was doing here at Iowa State. But stories, narratives, life experiences are, in fact, often our best teachers. Too often, we try to be rational, and we sort of ignore those stories. But many years ago, I was invited to participate in a major conference in St. Louis, Missouri, on the Lewis and Clark expedition. Well, given my academic interests in the lives of Indian women, I was asked to speak about Sacagawea, the Indian woman who accompanied Lewis and Clark across the country. I was picked up at the airport by two women who were old friends of mine, and there was a man sitting in the front seat. He was the keynote speaker for this conference. We were really rude because we were so excited to see each other that we talked on and on about everything in our lives and our kids and where we were. And this man in the front seat endured this all very patiently. And finally, when we were almost to the hotel, he turned to me and said something like, well, gee, you were a department chair and a dean, and what's the next job you want? What are your career goals? Well, the question really caught me off guard because planning for a definite goal had never been how I lived my life. So I told him I had never planned ahead. Rather, I had taken advantage of every opportunity. He said he was shocked. I mean, it was clearly he was shocked. And he said his goal was to have an endowed professorship by the time he was 50 years old. So of course, I asked him, well, did you make your goal? And he said, well, yes. He was indeed a very famous scholar. 
and we had been ignoring him, and it clearly was bothering him. Um, <clears throat> but I recovered, and I said, well, if you'd not achieved that goal, would you have been disappointed? Well, yes, he said. He, he would have been very disappointed. And I said, well, see, I'm never disappointed, because if you don't have specific goals, you're never going to be disappointed. I don't think he really got it. Uh, but what I suppose he was reflecting was the reality of the lives, what I was reflecting and what he wasn't hearing, was the reality of lives of many women. He didn't have to move to follow a husband's career. He didn't have to go to work and then come home and cook or change diapers or read bedtime stories, although he seemed like someone who probably would. He didn't face some of the obstacles that women in higher education and the workplace have learned to take for granted. My own academic career was not unlike those that of other women in my generation. I began teaching at Iowa State University in 1967 with a master's degree. I had moved here to move, put my husband through graduate school. By 1971, I was divorced with two small children, and it was clear that without a doctorate, I would not be successful in the academy. So I looked around for opportunities. Iowa State didn't have a doctoral program in English at that time, but Drake University was starting a new program at the doctoral level, a Doctor of Arts degree that had been initiated at Carnegie Mellon. Some colleagues advised me, colleagues here, that I shouldn't participate in this experiment. But the opportunity was there, and going anywhere else was not in the cards for me, so I trekked down to Des Moines and went to Drake University and took all their tests, found out I qualified for tuition assistance during the summers, so I returned to school. I continued to teach full time, which in those days meant four courses a quarter because Iowa State in those days was on the quarter system. Took one or two courses each semester at Drake, went full time during the summers, and ended up earning my doctorate after five years of this pretty rigorous regimen. Contrary to the warnings I had received, though, I found that the emphasis in this degree on pedagogy and the emphasis on administrative courses has served me well in my career. Well, the, my early experiences at Iowa State also provided my first exposures to gender discrimination, or at least gender discrimination in the workplace. My starting salary in 1967, I should ask some of you to guess what it was, was $6,600 a year. I learned soon after my appointment, though, that the men who had been hired that year received $6,800 a year. So I went to see the chairman. They were all chairmen in those days. And I asked why my salary was lower. He told me the men had families to support. <laughs> OK, well, I was the sole support for my family, but I guess that didn't matter. And I thought, I better just shut up and walk out of here, or I won't have a job at all. And so. I decided to be grateful I had a job and I left. So I mentioned these early experiences just to demonstrate a couple of things. Uh, one, the situation for women in the academy has changed and we have a ways to go. But two, these experiences helped me to polit help politicize me, help me understand that many women in the academy and the corporate world today succeeded against incredible odds. Well, I was fairly successful, finally, at Iowa State University. I had achieved the rank of professor, had numerous publications, the support of administrators. I even managed to get a salary equal to similarly qualified men. But then, for personal reasons, I decided to resign from my tenured position and move to California. Once again, I was warned that I was making a huge mistake. No one gives up tenure and <coughs> without a job at the other end. But I moved to California. I signed up as a substitute teacher. Luckily, I had taken advantage of another opportunity along the way and had learned, earned a lifetime teaching credential. Now, some of the women in the audience are old enough to remember the practical advice women got in those days. A teaching credential is something you can always fall back on. Remember that? So that's what I had, and I was able to do substitute teaching. I also accepted a part-time job as a lecturer teaching composition, and I started looking for a full-time job. When a job was advertised at Cal Poly Pomona for an associate dean of instruction, I applied. 
I learned later that the job was supposed to be open only to tenured faculty already at Cal Poly, but the search committee seemed to have not figured that out, so they interviewed me. They recommended me, and the provost called me in, and he asked me, the first question was, who are you? He actually said, who in the hell are you? Um, because I wasn't a faculty member there. Well, he hired me anyway, and I ended up working at Cal Poly for two years, and during that time, most of that time, we spent with my husband's uh, illness, and, fin and then he died, and there I was in California, excuse me, <clears throat> with my kids, and I was nominated to chair the Department of English at Arizona State University, so I was ready to move. Now, Arizona is an interesting place. It's getting more interesting if you're following what's going on there politically and what's happening with ethnic studies at the colleges and in the schools. And so it was interesting then, too, but it was a little bit different. The grocery store I shopped in had a sign that said, check your firearms. And South Phoenix had drive-by shootings every weekend. But there was a kind of can-do attitude at, our, at Arizona State University. So I was allowed to just sort of do things. Sometimes I did them and then I asked for permission, you know, it's all, or for forgiveness. It's usually easier to ask for forgiveness and permission. Uh, in my first year there, I was the first chair to hire two women in one shared position. Both of them were successful authors who did not want full-time jobs, but they both wanted the security and the prestige of being professors, and they wanted the opportunity to get tenure. I instituted reforms in search committees, and the search process resulted in high numbers of women and minority faculty being hired. I revised the system of hiring part-time lecturers, almost all of them women, so that these faculty were eligible for benefits and salary increases. I also wrote the grant to create the American Indian Institute on the campus. The good news is that all of these actions were valued at Arizona State, and I received the university's Affirmative Action Award. Well, after six years at ASU, I moved on to UC Santa Barbara as provost, went on to serve as provost at Washington State, then senior vice president at the University of North Carolina System, and then I moved to Denton, Texas to become president of the University of North Texas. Well, as you might guess, the first question, remember this is Texas, uh, I received from every reporter was, how does it feel to be UNT's first woman president? I cannot even tell you some of the flip responses I wanted to make. But I did realize that in Texas, and in fact elsewhere, it was unusual to have a female president of a research university. What I usually answered was that I assumed they had selected the best candidate for the position and moved on. In every position I've held, I see my, I've seen my role as a change maker because we know there are universities and businesses that still don't have pregnancy leaves, parental leaves, partner accommodation, insurance for domestic partners. Reentry women trying to get an education often need to become, start part time to adjust to new responsibilities or to balance home and family with school. Class schedules continue to be designed for the convenience of faculty members. This often means fewer night classes, fewer classes designed so both men and women can take advantage of schedules that make childcare and work scheduling or career changes easier. When my colleague Betsy Brown and I did research for our book, Faculty Career Paths, we concluded that all faculty want the same thing, satisfying careers that balance work with their personal lives. To accomplish this, universities must pay attention to such things as job sharing, partner accommodation and benefits, flex time, a delayed tenure clock for both men and women for childbirth and adoption, benefits that respond to the increasing needs of families responsible for the care of aging parents as well as preschool children. These are the same issues that corporate America is addressing. And at ACE, we actually have a number of grants where we're using the models from corporate America to apply to colleges and universities in this country to improve the work-life balance for employees at universities. So I told you I was gonna talk a little bit about ethics and values and integrity. 
I think if we truly believe in equal opportunity in eliminating discrimination, not just against women, but against anyone in our community, retaining our integrity is critical to leadership because leadership without ethics is in fact hollow. I got into administration during a period I can only characterize as tumultuous. I've already told you about some of those early teaching experiences. I was actually teaching from a reader called Crisis in the late 1960s. And there was a lot of crises, <laughs> there were a lot of crises around us. I decided <clears throat> early on, I guess, that being in a leadership position would be more effective than marching in the streets. My involvement in administrative matters started quietly. First as simple as serving on search committees, then moving on to chairing the American Indian Studies program, then chairing the Iowa Civil Rights Commission, all before I left Iowa. From there on, I continued to teach in all of my administrative positions. It was important for me to be connected with students, to know what students were thinking, to know what their issues were. And I continued to move up that administrative ladder. So there have been changes in my own role, and there have been changes in the issues, but the need to do right and to do the right thing continues to be an important force in my life. It is probably the most important force. So drawing from over 45 years of teaching and administrative experience, from junior high when I was doing substitute teaching in Los Angeles, I was teaching junior high bilingual students as a substitute teacher. Any of you in education, imagine that. Uh, taught graduate school, I've taught in seven different states and now I'm living in the District of Columbia. I've been in several academic departments. I know that faculty and administrators today face unprecedented changes in higher education. As an administrator, perhaps more than as a teacher, I have dealt with many ethical issues. Looking back, Sometimes I laugh about them, but at the time, all of them were serious, demanded thoughtful assessment, frequently required interpretation of policies, and almost always involved very strong emotions at all levels. Today, we talk about strategic planning, declining budgets, athletic scandals, accreditation retirements, requirements for student learning assessment, expectations for institutional responsibility, concern about lawsuits, charges of negligence, harassment, discrimination, you name it, the role of administrators is fraught with ethical dilemmas and with conflicting pressures, whether from legislatures, boards, federal agencies, or the public. What do we do to do right? How do we know the ultimate results of our decisions? What role does our basic character play in our decision-making process? Well, depending on one's role, administrators end up making or enforcing decisions about medical insurance, animal research, cloning, airport noise, nuclear waste disposal, guns on campus, stem cell research, bovine growth hormones, campus closures and lockdowns, HIV, AIDS, SARS, meningitis, athletic policies, immigration, and then the interpretation of existing campus policies. And even when we don't have to deal with every one of these issues, we are preparing students who must have the critical thinking skills to address these issues in their own futures. So let me give you an example. One day I received a phone call from risk management. It was almost five o'clock. Finally, maybe I could get to my email. And it was a, it's a great example of how unexpected issues <coughs> confront administrators. It was a representative from risk management, probably next to the attorney, the other person you don't want to hear from. He said he needed to see me to discuss a lawsuit being brought against my college. Turns out, there was a student on an anthropology field trip to Belize and his parents were suing the university because their son became ill after inhaling dry bat guano in a cave. Well, my first impulse was to laugh. Not because the student was ill, but because I had no idea what to do about a student who inhaled dry bat guano in a cave in Belize. Well, it turns out, of course, um, 
the student had been shipped to a major medical facility by his parents and they did the routine tests and found that he was in fact suffering from too much alcohol and illegal drugs. But he couldn't admit that to his parents so he had lied about having to go in this cave and this faculty member forcing him to go into this cave and in the end you know we resolved the whole thing and it was over. But that was only about halfway through the academic year and I'd already dealt with a police investigation into alleged embezzlement by one of the administrators who reported to me. A staff member who out of compassion had kept one of her employees on the payroll for two years after he moved to another state. And a lawsuit against the university because a parcel of land long ago deeded to one of the departments in the college had slid into a neighbor's yard during a 500 year flood. As you can tell this was at Santa Barbara. These responsibilities all seem to come under the category in my job description of day-to-day -day management or other duties as assigned. In other positions, I dealt with riots on campuses, hurricanes, floods, sadly the brutal murder of a student, suicides, and in one case a damaged nuclear facility. We get really mired in these details, in the crises, because we have to do something immediately. Once the crisis is over, we return to the ordinariness, or ordinariness of our lives. But that's really when we need to take a more expansive view. So let me tell you another story. This woman was walking along by a construction site. She wondered, hmm, wonder what's being built here. So she stopped the first worker she saw and said, what are you making? He scratched his head and answered about $12 an hour. <laughs> <clears throat> well, this wasn't the answer she was looking for. So she went to the next worker and said, again, what are you making? He answered, I'm making the concrete for the sidewalks. Still not satisfied. She asked a third worker, what are you making? This worker answered, I'm making a cathedral. This clearly was the worker with vision, the one who understood that whatever role he played in the construction project, he would be a contributor to something bigger than himself. This is, of course, the vision faculty hope to instill in their students and is the vision that we have for higher education. Our universities are built with bricks and mortar, to be sure, and increasingly our universities are virtual. But we must have a vision. We must know what to do as leaders. We must know how to make the right decisions and how to make a difference. When we're not in the crisis mode, we need to ponder these larger questions. There are some easy answers, but the execution of the ideas is what is difficult. What happens under our watch isn't enough. What matters is what happens next. What is our influence? We must have commitment and focus, and that focus must be on people. Investment in our colleagues is critical. Campuses need to ensure that the commitment to diversity and to the, and the empowerment of all members of the academic community is part of the strategic plan. Supervisors, particularly presidents, must hold people accountable. And data must be used to measure both performance and set expectations. And based on my own experiences, we shouldn't view conflict as uncommon or controversial but as educational. We need strategies to address conflict, and those strategies need to be proactive and not passive. In the end, we must put a human face on the consequences of discrimination, prejudice, and inequitable treatment. In spite of the barriers, women can and do succeed. They often do so because of the support of other women, because they understand networking, they seek out mentors, both men and women. All of this has been true for me. As the story goes, the turtle sitting on top of the fence post didn't get there by herself. So it's thanks to many women who are here tonight, Juanita, Evelyn, Hannah, Betsy, Pat, Kathy, Fern, many others, that I am where I am. Sometimes it helps though to go away from oneself and put this all in a global perspective. In Marianne Williamson's book, The Healing of America, she tells us that if we were to take 
the entire population of the world today and reduce it to a village with only 100 people. Keeping the ratios which currently exist, we would have 57 Asians, 21 Europeans, 14 from North and South America, 8 Africans, 70 not able to read, 50 suffering from malnutrition, 30 Christians, 30 who speak English, 6 owning 50% of the wealth of the village, and all 6 would be U.S. citizens. But there would be only one with a college education. We cannot forget that a college education is rare and extraordinary and places upon those who are so fortunate a tremendous burden of responsibility for the other 99 in our global village. This, quite frankly, is a responsibility that is not defined by gender or race or ethnicity or sexual orientation or age or ability. We must all accept the responsibility to contribute to making the world a better place, one that values each individual. In the end, that will be what happens next. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's a microphone there. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to uh, fill in the blanks. They're shy. Well, you know, I've been in classrooms long enough to know it takes a while before people actually ask a question. You've got a question over here. Uh, so leaders are often, uh, like you said, expected to have kind of a vision, um, especially when you know others may not exactly see you know the bigger plan. Um, as a result, sometimes those in the leadership position may be put in kind of a dilemma where, like, you know, it's like just trust me, like you know we're on the right track here, um, where you know the the ends or whatever essentially justify the means. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, how exactly do you find yourself dealing with that when? You know, you know, like the end goal uh, is right, even if, like, right now, uh, you know, it, it doesn't seem like we're on the right track with whatever plan we have going. Well, I, you know, one of the questions that you always get when you're interviewing is, "What is your leadership style?" And um, what I have found, really, that I think mine is, is I'm consultative and decisive. I think you, you, you may have a vision, but you don't have it alone. You have to consult with people, listen to people, talk with people. It's why I always kept teaching, so I would hear from students what's going on in their lives, what's happening with them. And then, once you hear it all, you've got to be decisive. And I, I honestly feel it's okay to be wrong. And so, you know, you make a decision, it's better than not doing anything, because not doing anything is making a decision as well. And so you make a decision, you hope that it works, and if it doesn't, you just retrench and, and go back. I, I think leaders do have to go out on a limb and uh, take that chance. You've answered everyone's question, I think. I did. There's a so, question oh. here. The students are all leaving. They've taken their notes and they're going back. <laughs> they're getting their credit, yes. What, what has been your biggest challenge? Oh, there have been so many. <laughs> My biggest challenge, I, oh, I don't know. They're all challenges at the time. I think right now my biggest challenge is, you know, to, to figure out how to retire. Uh, I keep failing retirement. And Betsy is saying no. What about the few students who are left? Some of you are still here. So you really were born way after all this stuff happened. Um, what, what are the issues now? Does any of this resonate with you? Or is it like it's so long ago, it's so yesterday? 
A representative student, okay. We're told not to pick on people and say you're representing students, but you have your view, right? <laughs> um, my question is, uh, I'm in a major that's still very, women are a very big minority still, and I was just wondering, if you do face any sort of discrimination, do you think it's better to address it professionally or to address it kind of with a sense of humor to not? Well, I, let me tell you another story to let you know. When I was appointed to the Iowa Civil Rights Commission, I had to go down and be introduced to the Senate to be confirmed. I studied everything I could possibly study about civil rights. I, was, I knew everything about the state, the federal legislation, everything. I went down there, it's a long time ago, and a big senator from somewhere out in the country put his arm around me and he said, okay, this young lady is here to be confirmed. Are there any questions? And I was ready. I was ready to answer questions. Not a single question. And he said, honey, pretty ladies always get confirmed. <laughs> now, what did I want to do? I wanted to kick him in the shins. I wanted to say, but wait a minute. <laughs> I want to give a speech about civil rights. I smiled nicely and said, thank you. I'm looking forward to making decisions about civil rights in Iowa. And I think he regretted that they didn't have any questions <laughs> as time went on. <laughs> so I think, you know, at the end, you know, sort of living well is the best revenge. Um, doing the right thing is the best revenge. And there's sometimes no reason to confront some of this uh, unless, unless clearly it's illegal, you know, abusive, harassment. I mean, you need to, but I mean, people are going to say to you, oh, well, I mean, my freshman chemistry class, the I was the only girl in the class. I was asked who did my homework. No one could imagine that, you know, I could do my own homework. And you just sort of say, okay, fine. You'll figure this out when I take the test and get an A. I did my own homework. So, so just be tough and keep going. I always say don't get mad at me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Hi. Hi. What advice do you have for women who are struggling with the concept of leadership and, is, and, and viewing themselves as leaders? Are you a faculty member, a student? A graduate student. Okay. Why are you you're struggling with the concept of leadership? And, and sometimes it's because they've been brought up in a family, a household, an educational environment where, where they didn't get those leadership opportunities and were in fact sort of chastised for having an opinion or being strong. So you have to just keep encouraging them to, uh, to have those opinions, to, to do it slowly. I mean, sometimes you have to give them a chance to do something, succeed at it and say, wow, you did a great job. Why don't you do this next? And, and move them along. Um, it's hard because there, there are still many women who do not see themselves as being in a leadership position or capable of leadership. Thank you all for being here tonight. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm happy to be back here in Ames.